morning. So yeah, t uh, Tim Demenel, I'm the hydrogen asset manager at uh, at Storega. Thought probably useful just a little bit of personal background context. So uh, I graduated as a mechanical engineer in 1994, and I worked in industrial energy management and combined heat and power for about four years, and then I became a senior manager with Diageo for 15 years. I worked across four different continents. I worked as a continuous improvement manager for the Guinness breweries across Africa for three and a half years. I was the supply chain director in Bangkok for three years. I, I ran Bundaberg Rum uh, Distillery in Australia for three years. And then uh, six of Diageo's malt uh, distilleries in Speyside for four years, about a third of their malt scotch. And finally, I ran the entire co-product operations for Diageo for, for two years. And during my time in, in Speyside, the six years, I set up and ran a, an energy minimization work stream from scratch, and I was part of the carbon neutral work stream. And then at the end of uh, 2013, I just decided, yeah, I had 15 years of uh, career left, and I wanted to go and spend that 15 <coughs> years working full time on large scale climate change mitigation. And very soon, in, in early in 2014, I met. Uh, some guys for a company called Pale Blue Dot Energy, Pale Blue Dot being the Earth, the planet, and uh, we really hit it off. Uh, they su were so very supportive of some of the ideas that I wanted to continue to do for the Scotch Whiskey Association, and Pale Blue Dot is now Storega. So we set up a new parent company about three years ago, which I'll explain about in just a moment. Okay. So, yeah, Storega, we're a, a decarbonisation developer. Uh, we've been working in the area of carbon capture and storage and hydrogen for about 15 years. Um, our core areas are, are the, the, the capture of, of fossil fuel derived uh, carbon dioxide and the sequestration of that, so carbon mitigation. We're also looking at and working on the capture of biogenic, closed loop biogenic CO2 emissions in terms of carbon reparation, so to be able to help to reduce the 430 parts per million of CO2 within the, uh, in the atmosphere. As part of our carbon capture uh, mitigation, we're working on blue hydrogen, uh, and we also have a, a, a separate uh, division business unit around uh, uh, green hydrogen, and that's mainly my role. So I, I've created most of the projects that you'll see now on the next few slides, and, and I lead and sponsor our sort of Scottish green hydrogen uh, activity. In all, the, the projects that we're working on are, are really uh, involve quite a, a, a high capital cost. Uh, so hence we've needed to be able to bring on supportive shareholders. And so that's why uh, three years ago we set up Storega as the new parent company and that allowed us to get uh, uh, equity in investment from Macquarie uh, in our round one. And then in our round two we brought in GIC who are the Singaporean Sovereign Wealth Fund. They're one of the largest uh, clean energy infrastructure investors in the world, uh, Macquarie, the biggest infrastructure investor globally, Mitsui, the Japanese conglomerate, uh, M&G, formerly Prudential, the largest uh, uh, investment fund in the UK, and SNAM own and operate the entire gas network in, in Italy, and, and they're leading the European hydrogen backbone. So we've got some big sponsors and backers who believe in what we're doing and are, and, and are putting some significant, significant investment in behind <coughs> our projects. Let's, let's pull it back to, to Scotland and, and what we're here uh, to talk about today. And, and, and this is really around uh, uh, the aim to achieve carbon neutrality for the uh, Scottish whisky industry. Uh, so several years ago, whilst the report was done by Ricardo, I worked with the Scotch Whisky Association behind the background to help write the, uh, the Scotch Whisky Association's pathway to net zero. And whilst the uh, Scotch whisky industry makes up a relatively small percentage of carbon emissions within Scotland. Within certain regions, so this Cromarty region and the Speyside region, as an example, they make up quite a significant component of the fossil fuel usage, either through the fuel that is used for distillation or the fuel for the heavy goods vehicles that move distilling product and co-product around. And so what, and this is one of several pathways that were identified within the in the SWA report. This is the balanced pathway and, and probably the most realistic and, uh, 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 outcome that we're going to see. It basically sort of says we've got a baseline of, of, of carbon emissions and what we want to do is to really eat into that baseline through energy efficiency, get your house in order, good practice, good housekeeping, monitoring and targeting, 
chase that low-hanging fruit. And you can deliver, and particularly if each of the distillers learn from each other, which they do, they're very good, it's a very open industry, particularly with working groups within the Scotch Whiskey Association. <coughs> Uh, the sector are, are leading and, and have done some really good work and they'll learn from each other. So first of all, yeah, energy efficiency. And as part of that energy efficiency is what we've been hit talking about today in terms of TVR, so thermal vapour recompression. But this more broader piece of the majority of the energy that you put into a distillery goes into the stills and eventually goes through into the spirit vapour and into the cooling water. And if you can recover that uh, heat from the cooling water or before it goes into the cooling water and recycle that back into the process. So condenser heat recovery, whether, whether it's thermal vapor recompression, mechanical vapor recompression, or electrically driven high temperature heat pumps, then that again can deliver you a significant part of the innovation part of, uh, of energy efficiency. What you then have left is your, your, your uh, fuel your residual fuel usage, and then it's about fuel switching. So it's basically seeing if you can electrify through putting in an electric steam boiler, if you can get an electrical connection from the grid to enable you to do that, or switching to a, another fuel, so a bioenergy or hydrogen. Uh, the only fuels really that are sort of seen in terms of uh, as a viable clean combustion form of fuel that will meet some of the net zero targets that uh, the distillers and others are looking for. Okay. So hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen. <coughs> so you'll notice I talk about both blue hydrogen and green hydrogen under a low carbon uh, heading. So blue hydrogen is around the reforming of natural gas. So taking CH4 and splitting natural gas into hydrogen and carbon dioxide, but then permanently sequestering and removing that carbon dioxide. Okay. Green hydrogen is using renewable electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen and then being able to use that hydrogen. So both forms can produce hydrogen that <coughs> will meet a, low, a UK government low carbon hydrogen standard. Okay? And certainly in terms of our projects, uh, the, the ACORN hydrogen project at uh, St Fergus, a blue hydrogen project, and then our chromity and and um, space side green hydrogen projects will meet that sort of uh, emissions intensity of 20 grams per, uh, of CO2 per megajoule of, of energy produced. Okay, and this is really important because it's a, it's a really important standard to ensure consistency, to ensure credibility around the, the, cl uh, the, the clean uh, hydrogen that is, is, is going to be adopted. And this standard is also, there's a, almost an equivalent standard for the European Union. I think their figure is about 18 uh, versus the 20 that we've got for the UK. So in terms of uh, what are the projects that we're working on. So about four years ago, we, we came up with this title of the North of uh, Scotland Hydrogen Programme. Um, and really it was looking at SGN, Scotia Gas Networks, run the... Uh, low pressure gas distribution network across the north of Scotland. This map here in the middle shows it. So these white lines here are the national uh, gases, national transmission system pipelines. This is St Fergus. One third of the UK's natural gas makes landfall and makes its way through Scotland and in through into the rest of the UK. But there's a couple of offtake points down here near Aberdeen that feed this intermediate pressure pipeline that pretty much follows the A96 all the way across the north of Scotland through to a place called Conan Bridge and then right through here to Invergordon Grain Distillery. So Invergordon Grain Distillery is the no, uh, uh, most northern point of the UK gas network. Okay. And so we've been working with SGN, Scotia Gas Network, since 2017, mainly around the Acorn Hydrogen Project here at uh, St Fergus. And through those conversations that we had with them, they sort of said, well, how do you move this existing gas network that runs on 100% natural gas to 100% hydrogen? And they said, well, what you do is you start at the end of the pipelines and you push 100% hydrogen along the pipeline and you convert users as you go. You take a section at a time and a section at a time. So what we then did as a hydrogen project developer is we started to look at the end of pipelines. Here's an end of a pipeline and here's some ends of pipelines. And they just happen to be Cromarty and Speyside. And what you have in those two areas are your what we call anchor off-takers, the distilling sector. And that's why 
four years ago we, we, we started uh, the, the Cromarty Hydrogen Project. In the first half of uh, 2021 we concluded the feasibility study and that's why we're now progressing these three projects which form the North of Scotland Hydrogen Programme. So specifically to, to Cromarty, so the Cromarty Hydrogen Project is literally based about five miles up the road, or it's going to be based about five miles up at the road at Scottish Power's Ben Tarson Wind Farm. Okay, so the, it, it, as we concluded that feasibility study in the first half of 2021, we brought Scottish Power in as a, as a, as a development partner, and so it's, it's Scottish Power and Sturega that are now co-developing uh, the Cromarty Hydrogen Project. And the Cromarty Hydrogen Project is, is going to take existing but constrained renewable power from across the highlands and convert this into hydrogen which is then used as a fuel for heavy heat and heavy transport applications, primarily for the distillers and the distilling sector. Our phase one, we're looking to install 30 what's called megawatts of electrolysis capacity. So taking just over 30 megawatts of, of electricity into these, these 30 megawatts of, uh, of electrolyzers to produce hydrogen. But that's phase one. The idea is that uh, between now and that phase one will become operational in, in, in early 2026. But by the time we fully build out this regional solution by the end of 2030, we're aiming for it to be about 300 megawatts in electrolysis across the region to help deliver that sort of 20% figure that you saw on the SWA slide, not just for the distilling sector but for the region as a whole. What we're also working on, and this is a project that we built into the Cromarty Green Freeport bid, and we had Rishi Sunak up here in the region in, in uh, uh, the end of January to announce the successful bid from the Cromarty, hydrogen, uh, from the Cromarty uh, Freeport team, and, and within that we built in the, the Cromarty, what's known as Power to X project. So this is looking to say, well, when you build all of these Scotwind wind farms, who's going to use that power? Because the grid infrastructure between here in the north of Scotland down into your main load centres in Teesside and Humberside and Merseyside doesn't yet exist. So we're going to have to significantly upgrade all of those cables. Why not instead build big load centres up here in the north of Scotland? Let's do chromity hydrogen, let's do space height hydrogen, and in particular, let's do Cromarty Power Tex. So we're about to sign an agreement with a quite a significant global developer. Uh, and between us, we're going to form phase one, 600 megawatts. We're looking to have operational within 2027. And that'll be 600 megawatts of electrolysis to make ammonia, to make fertilizer, to make food. Okay. And again, another part of how we're looking to sort of decarbonize uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, ammonia and more so fertiliser manufacturing makes up over 6% of the global carbon emissions. So it's a, it's a significant use of hydrogen today. So when you look at these uh, heavy, let's call them the, uh, the feedstock or the heavy heat, heavy fuel users, what's important to them? What, what's important to, to Sean and, and, and to John? And, and regularly this is spoken about as this sort of energy trilemma. So we're here saying, yeah, you know, it's carbon emissions. Carbon emissions is the most important thing. You know, the sustainability director will say, I want to achieve net zero. Um, and, but John will say, actually, no, I want to keep my distillery running. It's most important in terms of security of supply. Is uh, I, I, I've got a 24-hour operation. I need to, to, to have uh, fuel and a reliable energy source to be able to run my operation. Whereas um, Malcolm will probably say it's about the cost. Yeah. No, no. no, no. <laughs> Yeah, I need to make sure that uh, you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. And this is what they call this energy trilemma. Um, and one of the things that we're looking to try and address through with, with, with hydrogen is principally we're focusing on the security of supply. One of the reasons of building a, a regional hydrogen hub with two production centres is, is to ensure security of supply. Uh, yes, we're looking to achieve uh, this uh, uh, outcome in terms of net zero, but we do want to make sure that we're, we're focused on cost and trying to deliver the lowest levelized cost of hydrogen that we can out of our project as well. But we do recognize that it's this, this dynamic and this balance between these three forces. But ultimately, you know, for the customer, as I said, feedstock, heavy heat or, or heavy transport, yeah, it's that security of supply 
and it's also what we refer to as security of cost. So one of the things of hydrogen, particularly with uh, renewable power, and we're able to enter into long-term power purchase agreements, is that we can provide some stability and some long-term view around that uh, security of cost. And that's because ultimately, as a developer, we're fully responsible for the full chain solution. We have to reverse engineer this back from the customer. So we need to listen to, to Sean and John and their needs and understand that we can meet that because we have to be able to work together to be able to deliver this solution. So my final slide is just to talk about, about the solution and what we're looking to do here. You know, this, this fuel switching of, of heavy heat and, uh, and heavy transport. So what we're, we're going to have is, is yeah, about five kilometres up, up, the, up the road here uh, at the Ben Tarson uh, wind farm, we'll have the hydrogen production plant. So that's taking electricity from the wind farm. When the wind's not blowing, we'll use the wind farm's grid connection to import power to run the facility. Okay? And we will do that only with renewable power. We will, we will only enter into renewable power purchase agreements, so 100% of the electrons we use are going to be green. Okay? And we're then going to put that hydrogen into tube trailers, high pressure horizontal cylinders on, a, on, on the back of, a, of, of a, truck, uh, a truck. And these tankers will then come through to the distillery, and, and, and what we're putting, uh, in, looking to install here is what we call tanker option A, which is a dual tanker bay, so the, the tube trailer will come, come along, it'll be parked up, the truck will, the cab will move away, the trailer's there, it's plugged in, and the boiler will just draw the hydrogen from the tube trailer. As the tube trailer starts to get near to empty, it sends a signal to base and, and to the transporter that says, hey, I need, re I need replacing, and the second trailer will, will come and park up, uh, plug in, the second, first trailer will be disconnected. The, the, the cab, uh, the, the, the truck will then pick that one up and take it back to the hydrogen production plant to be refilled and then redeployed to another site. Okay? And so we're going to be working with, with John and, and Sean and the team here. We have a hydrogen dispense cabinet that will then feed through into that, uh, into that boiler house. And the specific plan for the site is at the back of the site. Uh, there's there's a, 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 a greenfield area and we'll look to build a new boiler house with a, a hydrogen boiler in that with, a, with a, a dual fuel backup. We spoke about the hydrogenated vegetable oil as a backup fuel earlier on. We'll, we'll commission that boiler, we'll get it up and running with the team here, and then once it's far and away and working perfectly, that gives the site the confidence then to decommission their existing LPG uh, boiler, um, and, and away we go. And that's what we're looking to do across a, a portfolio. Uh, our phase one is, is oversubscribed. Uh, we've, we've got eight customers in total at this point in time, uh, mainly distillers, 12 locations, all within 25 miles of the, uh, of the hydrogen production site. And then our phases two, three, and four, that's where we'll, we'll build out the, the, the significant proportion of the, of, the, of the volume. And a large part of that is then looking to connect into that glass pipeline that I showed you earlier on from Conan Bridge through to Invergordon, where we can inject the majority of the hydrogen into the gas network to enable fuel switching at a much larger scale uh, from natural gas.